started. So uh, it's nice to see a big full room. Welcome to another week of the Behavior Evolution and Culture Seminar Series. Um, I'm going to give you a little preview of next week. We have two speakers coming in. Uh, and the rest of the quarter is up on our website at beck.ucla.edu, so be sure to check that out. Uh, on Monday, at the normal time, uh, we have Mary Shank coming from the University of Missouri, and her talk is entitled, Why Does Fertility Decline? Comparing Evolutionary Models of the Demographic Transition. And on Wednesday, we have a special uh, extra back talk. It's on in this room at the normal time at, at 12 o'clock, uh, but on Wednesday, May 18th. And that's uh, Federico Rosano, who's coming from the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology. And his talk is entitled, Structure and Development of Gestural Communication in Gray Apes. So be sure to join us for both of those. Today, uh, I'm very happy to welcome Peter Nonax. He's coming from our CCLA Department of Ecology and <coughs> Evolutionary Biology. And his talk is entitled, Age Can Selection Dead? And is it time to move on in understanding the evolution of cooperation? Welcome. Thank you. Um, in, as, as you'll see, in the spirit of um, the comments and the papers I'll be talking about shortly, uh, my title is completely over the top and excessive, and the idea is sort of a, a pitiful attempt to draw attention to myself and so on, and it kind of looks like it worked, yeah. So, okay, so uh, kin selection to start out with, he's not dead. Uh, most, most people will agree that, that oftentimes individuals will do something to help other individuals that are related to them. Uh, what actually I think people are more arguing about as to what is, what is possibly dead is this, uh, Hamilton's rule. And so this is sort of one way of describing kin selection in a very sort of simple, straightforward way that in, in many cases um, produces something that's sort of testable. So uh, what we have in Hamilton's rule then is that, that individuals ought to cooperate, individuals ought to help others if the cost to themselves is less than the benefit that the relative gets prorated by the actual relatedness value. <coughs> so there's two ways that this rule could be dead, and I'll sort of talk about both today. One is that it's just mathematically not sufficient to explain how cooperation evolves. That it's, it's too simple, it, it puts too many things together in those terms, and it just doesn't work as a mathematical explanation. And the second is that basically it may be true, it may, it may work mathematically, but the problem is that this is not the way cooperation evolves. So it's not a major factor or force for the evolution of cooperation. There's other methods or, or other uh, evolutionary uh, forces that are more important. So those are the two ways I'm going to try to talk about today that, that we might think about kin selection being uh, sort of past its due date. Okay, so the thing that sort of started this, this, this or really sort of brought everything to the fore is this paper that appeared um, a little under a year ago in Nature by, by Martin Nowak, Corinna Tarnita, and, and Edward O. Wilson. And it was entitled The Evolution of Youth Sociality, which by its title doesn't seem to be, you know, worthy of having a room like this come and listen to about it. Uh, <laughs> In essence, what is eusociality? Well, eusociality, again, there's sort of debates about what exactly is eusocial and isn't. But for the most part, people sort of argue eusociality is where you have morphological or facultative reproductive castes. So in other words, you have a social group where some individuals will reproduce and other individuals won't, either because they facultatively decide not to, or morphologically in some cases that they simply cannot reproduce. And so for the most part, we think about you social organisms being ants, uh, wasps, bees, termites, and then uh, sort of a few other sort of things out there. And again, sort of looking around this room, uh, I'm probably just about the only person here who works on organisms that are, you know, everybody agrees are you social. So again, it's not, it's not something that, that by itself is going to necessarily, everyone's organism is you social. It may be sort of a bit of a limited thing. Secondly, they prov provided a new model for the evolution of this phenomenon, evolution of eusociality. Uh, it's not in the main paper. It's uh, a lot of the math is in sort of a 41-page supplemental thing that comes along with it, very, very dense and so on. Uh, I'm going to sort of summarize it for you. Um, basically, this is it. 
individuals and groups have higher reproductive success. And that selects for cooperation and group behavior. Um, everyone's reaction, I think, ought to be, duh. Of course, I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of almost a tautology. It has to be true, right? Groups, if, if groups are going to evolve, they have to have some advantage to them. And so the fact that individuals are more successful in groups than they are by themselves will, will always favor the evolution of groups. So the, so the model that they put forward is not particularly useful in the sense that it sort of just predicts something that de facto literally must be true. So we're not so sure where it's going to go. So okay, so you have this paper, again, on a phenomenon that may be restricted to, you know, a certain groups of animals. A model that is not really that predictive or, or novel. Why did this paper attract so much attention? Why am I standing up here talking about it? Well, within two months, there were four responses or correspondence to this paper, three of which were sort of saying, yeah, right, this is good. This is something people should be thinking about. And this guy, Peter Nonax, <laughs> Who, uh, who actually sort of said, well, one of their major examples that they used for supporting their arguments and so on actually is not useful for their arguments. It actually supports the opposite of what they're, what they're sort of saying um, in 200 words and less. And uh, in that same journal, there was a much longer sort of comment by Samir Akasha, which basically said, everybody play nice, please. Please play nice. Stop arguing about these things, you know, respect each other and so on. So, okay, so you have, a, you have a paper, right? Gets into nature. It's not an easy thing to do. And then, you know, a month and a half later, five more sort of comments about this paper appear in nature. Again, which sort of indicates that, that somehow people think it's important. Um, and then it doesn't stop there, of course. And just this last March, so a month and a half ago, um, there were four more critiques of that original paper, plus their response to those critiques and so on. So here's sort of the, the brief communications arriving. All of these were on, uh, online, so they did save some paper. No trees died for this. Um, now, these were actually critiques, and they basically went after the paper. They, they said, okay, the, the authors really don't understand theory. Uh, their math isn't necessarily correct. Um, they mostly ignore and misrepresent existing data, and their conclusions are either trivial or inappropriate. But other than that, other than that, okay. So that's pretty damning criticisms, right? And the most surprising thing, or the most interesting thing about all these criticisms is the number of people that signed on to them. So again, there were four critiques. One of them had 137 authors on it signing this, this critique. And I think there were like 150 all told on there. Uh, you notice my name isn't on there. I was, I was asked to sign, but we can get into reasons why I didn't. Uh, I don't think anybody in this room has signed it. But how many, you know, how many times do you have a paper that is signed by 137 authors saying, OK, this other paper you published is entirely garbage and should be ignored? So again, why all this fuss, right? So again, this paper comes out. It's on you sociality. It's not necessarily something that everybody's going to be interested in. It comes up with a model that, again, for its predictive you know, uh, abilities is not so much. But why all this fuss about this one particular paper? And that is because, of course, it's not just one particular paper. It is something that's sort of been building over a number of years. And what's been building is mostly arguments by this fellow, Edward O. Wilson, one of the major evolutionary biologists of this or any generation, who basically has been raising the point again and again and again that kin selection is dead. In fact, he went as far as to call it a gimmick. And he has done so for about six years in various papers uh, of various profile, high profile, um, sometimes by himself, uh, sometimes with co-authors, most often with uh, David Sloan Wilson of, of group selection fame. And so all of these papers have been leading up to this 2010 paper, coming back with, again, the same argument, kin selection is wrong, doesn't explain anything. And instead, 
What explains the evolution of cooperation is group level selection. Group selection, not kin selection. So again, so what you see in the 2010 paper is Wilson raising this argument again, but now backed by, by some really heavyweight mathematical evolutionary modelers in Nowak and, and Tarnica, also raising this issue of that there's problems with kin selection models in theory. And in fact, if you go to a recent interview in the Boston Globe, Wilson is even more upfront about what he says. And so again, he's sort of saying, nothing we were finding connected with kin selection. I knew something was wrong. There was a smell to it. Okay, you ever smelled your own research? Okay. Uh, and then, then very definitively, right, kin selection is wrong. That's it. That's it. It's wrong. Right? So as, as straightforward as, as you can possibly be, basically kin selection's out the window. And even in this paper by, by Nowak, Tarnica, and Wilson, there were lots of quotes in it that you don't generally find in sort of scientific papers. And so again, the paper was not so much promoting, say, a new model. I think the new model, again, is, is, is fairly boring and unpredictive. But what they were doing is they were going after the existing paradigm, the existing model of kin selection of Hamilton's rule. And basically you find quotes like this within the paper in that 41 page supplemental. Uh, this paper is directed at empiricists that still try to test classical Hamilton's rule and at theoreticians who try to artificially interpret every result as classical Hamilton's rule. So anyway, uh, saying is, don't be an idiot. Quit doing this. You know, let this on. <coughs> when the data do not fit, elaborations of inclusive fitness can be constructed that make them fit. The results of the elaborations are a, a Ptolemaic theory constructed of epicycles to keep relatedness at the center of evolving social systems. Now, I mean, how many people of you have published papers where you accuse your critics of basically believing that, you know, that the Earth is at the center of the universe? Um, that's what they're sort of doing, again, is that the fact that, that, that kin selection is no more valid, is no more useful than, than, than what we used to believe about where the Earth was positioned. And again, so the epicycles of inclusive fitness calculations are not needed, given that we can formulate precise descriptions of how natural selection acts. So again, they're basically being very dismissive about people that sort of believe in kin selection. And the one comment that I think really, really, really ticked <laughs> everybody off was this. The production of inclusive fitness theory must be considered <laughs> meager. So in other words, all you hundreds of people who've been out there testing Hamilton's rule, looking at inclusive fitness, all the thousands of papers that have come out on it, none of it's really tested or showed anything. Um, this is really sort of a rhetorical sharp stick in the eye uh, for a lot of people, right? So, so you can sort of see why people got upset. And so naturally, when you go again and you go on to online and see what people are saying, there's a lot of response to this. So Stuart West basically talks about his letter that he was one of the signers on. And again, is our letter is in the hope that we'll keep non-specialists from wasting time on it. In other words, if you haven't read the Nowak et al. paper, don't. Uh, I think it's so wrong that I don't think it will have any effect on what people in the field are doing. Um, so if you do read it and you think that there's something in there, you're an idiot. Okay. Uh, Jerry Coyne, an evolutionary biologist at Chicago, runs a very, very interesting blog. It's called Why Evolution is True. Lots of sort of spirited discussion there. What does he say? It's simply two guys and a woman deeply misunderstanding evolution and trying to parlay this misunderstanding into fame. <laughs> right? And then secondly, Wilson and his colleagues have been making the same arguments for several years and they've already been answered. But like creationists, these guys go on making the same fallacious, fallacious claims. So okay, you're going to call me a, a Ptolemaic, you know, flat earther, I'm going to call you a creationist. You know, we're going to get back at you. And then, of course, we can't leave off the, the dark lord of the gene himself, uh, <laughs> Richard Dawkins, who comes and says, you know, Edward Wilson was misunderstanding kin selection as far back as sociobiology. So for 30 years, he doesn't understand anything, you know. 
And, and a voice and opinion that he puts into print that I think I've heard again and again and again over sort of drinks and so on, it's almost universally regarded as a disgrace that nature published this paper. And I think the second part is very, very true. They, the reason they published it was the <coughs> eminence of Wilson and Nowak, not the quality of the paper. So I don't think this paper would have ever gotten into nature had it not been authored by Wilson and Nowak, who have, shall we say, a bit of a reputation. Okay, so people are slamming back at them. Now, Martin Nowak, not a shrinking violet himself, uh, basically comes back and says, okay, what's all this criticism about? Well, you know, it's these people clinging to this, what's obviously now an obsolete theory. <laughs> and brings back the old epicycles cycles again, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's, it's clearly they're, cons they're just sort of constructing more epicycles to sort of try and rationalize away what I'm saying. And again, there's a grain of truth to this. Is I don't, know, I don't think that all those 150 people that signed those papers <coughs> necessarily went through line by line that 41 page, very dense sort of supplemental material. And so I think Nowak is right. They don't really know what they're arguing against. Uh, the critics don't understand the math. And moreover, and this is sort of an important point to come back to, they don't realize that the math is the most important part of this paper. And then what he says is now they're not only believing in, in epicycles, but they're alchemists. Um, it's like alchemy, you know, what they believe in in terms of kin selection. And then this is what I emphasize here, and I'll try to make, sh make uh, a point as to why I do it. There is no other theory than math. Mathematics is the only theory. So if you have an idea of how the world works, if you don't have the math for it, it's not worth anything. And if you have the math for it, then maybe you don't even need to look at the world. The math is enough. OK, so where are we now? So literally, um, it's kind of depressing if you actually believe what they say. It's sort of, it's sort of I think the, 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 the giants of modern evolutionary biology are all sort of really dimwits who you know, believe all these falsities that are obviously, obviously wrong, right? And secondly is, Maybe this is just a, an argument, a bunch of guys who just don't like each other and just sort of say things. And I emphasize the guys because as you'll see, this, this argument is really loaded with why soak testosterone. So, you know, why chromosomes are really involved in this more so than anything else. But I think, and I'll get to it, I think there is actually sort of a real, real issue here. So this is, this is sort of the end of the fun part. I'm not going to put up any more quotes. Now I'm sort of actually going to try to get into what they're arguing about. And I say that I think there's two things. One is, does the math of the Hamilton's rule work? And secondly, does it actually describe what we see out there? So let's get into the math of it. And we'll talk about Nowak versus West. So I sort of just have sort of the, the, the protagonist there. And what they're really talking about is something that's called Price's equation. And Price's equation is, is a really really very nice intuitive way of looking at selection in terms of, of kin groups and so on from a population genetic standpoint. And basically the argument that they're having is whether or not Price's rule or Price's equation is a general rule. So in other words, this is something that applies very widely in nature or is it something that's really, really a special case where you have to make lots of constraining assumptions and it's unlikely to apply to most of what's going on in the world. So what is Price's equation? Well, it's this. You're basically looking at the increase of a trait. To be, again, for sociality, for helping. The change in that gene frequency. And that change in gene frequency is going to be determined by two factors. The change that happens due to selection across groups and the change due to selection that's going on within groups. So you can sort of, you can sort of uh, divide up the selection that's happening for a particular allele into those two different sort of compartments. And it turns out that these compartments sort of fit reasonably well to what we think about as Hamilton's rule. Here's your R value, your relatedness. Here's the benefit you provide to others. And there's the cost that the altruist incurs to itself. And with a little bit of rearranging, again, you can basically draw out Hamilton's rule, RB minus C greater than, than zero. And so if this is true, then that trait for cooperation, for helping, 
is positively selected and it should increase in the population. If it's not true, it's selected again, so it should disappear from the population. And so nobody has any sort of argument with this. You can, you can do the math and you can draw out this equation. And so what the people like West are arguing is that since Hamilton's rule is analogous to population genetics model, it doesn't matter which way you do it. It doesn't matter if you use Hamilton's rule or population genetics. They're just two different methods of getting to the same answer. And if this one is easier and more appropriate, why not use this? The argument that Nowak would make is that this is fine, but the problem lies in with a lot of the assumptions that you get here in getting Price's equation in the first place. That it assumes many different things about the populations and how selection operates and the effect of, of individual mutations and onwards. And that when you put all this together, Price's equation is a very, very special case. And that most of the situations that you look at in nature aren't going to be special cases. So it's an inappropriate way of trying to model this process in the first place. Okay. Now, why these two views? Well, if West is correct, if that's the argument, then what you can basically think about models as being actor-based. So in other words, you sort of say, if you're an offspring, do you stay at home and help your parents raise more siblings? If you're off somewhere and you have an opportunity to, to help another individual, do you actually help that individual? So you basically look at it from the standpoint of the individual is doing the behavior, the actor. Now that's a, that's a very sort of intuitive way that we think about the world. You know, we don't think about, hmm, does my gene for helping make me want to, you know, help my siblings? Um, so we think about it in terms of actor ways, and that's the way when we go out and test, we look at what animals do. They're the actors. We see whether or not they're behaving in ways that, we, that our models have predicted. Now, again, we don't go out and sort of say, okay, well, is this, is this allele doing what this allele ought to do? Because, again, we cannot see individual alleles, we cannot see individual sort of genotypes, we only see the actors. So if this is, if this, if West's viewpoint is right, then we can use sort of a much more intuitive way of looking at the world and thinking about it and gaining sort of predictive powers in our models and our experiments. Now, one of the things I'm not going to do in this talk is tell you which of these viewpoints is correct. I'm not even going to offer an opinion as to which of these viewpoints is correct. Because there are a lot of evolutionary biologists out there that are far better at doing equations in math than me, and they can't agree. And you basically have not only Martin Nowak, but you have a whole list of fairly influential, fairly, fairly you know, Smart people basically saying this is a special case, and they're adamant it's a special case. And you have an equal list of luminaries on the other side basically saying, no, it's not a special case. It's very much sort of a general case, and you can use it. And so I'm not going to, I'm not, like I say, I'm not going to challenge any of these people. They're all smarter than me with their mathematics and so on, and I can't really understand all the details of their arguments. But all I can say is that they're very smart people, and they completely disagree with each other. And that's sort of where, where I'll, I'll leave it. What I want to sort of say is, what are sort of things that the people who raise problems with the price equation, what are the things that they raise that sort of resonates with me as sort of a particular problem? It sort of intuitively seems to me like a problem that Hamilton's rule is not good at solving. And so I want to raise sort of three cases, not in any sort of mathematical way, but just sort of as, as a conceptual thing to look at and see why Hamilton's rule might not work in these cases. And one is a problem of accounting for indirect effects, right? So we have two individuals, A and B, two actors. A does something for B which provides a benefit to B at a cost to A, right? And so again, we can use Hamilton's rule and say, is A going to do this? Is it advantageous for A to do this behavior if RB is greater than C? So if this is true, then A ought to do that behavior for B. Not a, not a big problem. So again, you sort of think about this. Ah, you know, you're walking along a, a rushing stream, and you see your brother in the stream in imminent danger of drowning, right? Should you leap into that stream at 
probably, you know, great personal risk to save your brother and pull them out. And if you do leap into that stream, pull your brother out, and then your brother <sighs> survives and goes off and has kids, then those kids would not have existed without that sort of altruistic act. So you can sort of say, okay, well that's, that's, that's sort of the RB, the benefit of those extra kids who would not have existed if my brother had drowned, you know, uh, uh, decremented by the relatedness. And the cost, again, is what would happen if I actually jumped in and drowned along with him and did not have kids. So that would be C. That's reasonably simple. But the problem is this. Suppose you do rescue your brother, and rather than going off and having kids like he ought to, he goes off and helps a whole bunch of other relatives have four kids, right? Now those kids, again, maybe cousins, kids, maybe other siblings and so on, those kids would no longer, would, would not exist without you having saved the brother, right? So again, do they then tie into your inclusive fitness? Because it's sort of, even though it's sort of, couple of steps down the road, it's something that would not have actually happened without you acting. And so there, it's not so clear what the benefit is. It's a bit of a problem. It becomes more of a problem when you have these sort of cascading indirect effects going on. Second thing, again, that people raise that sort of strikes me as intuitively sort of a problem for some of this is again, suppose we have sort of this interaction with A and B. And again, the interaction is, is, is beneficial, it's positive, A does it, it's good. Um, but they're sort of embedded in a group that again, contains other related individuals. Now suppose what happens in this interaction between, between A and B is some sort of positive public good. So something not only just to help A and B, but some sort of good comes out of it that diffuses again out into the entire group as a whole. So again, it's not due to any sort of direct interaction between A and anybody else, but again, it's sort of a public good that happens. Again, it becomes more difficult to sort of figure out what is the appropriate equation here in terms of Hamilton's rule. Now, I'm not saying this is not solvable. It is solvable, but you have to start doing things like, like thinking about not the relatedness of a particular actor, but the average relatedness, say, of this group. So where this benefit goes out to. And you have to sort of think about the relatedness of this group as opposed to the relatedness of a bunch of random individuals that might be out in the population and so on. So what, how much more related is this group than some, again, random collection of individuals that may share this public good? Now again, that's not to say that you can't figure this out and that you can't sort of figure out whether or not this, is, this is, gets, gets selected. But what happens is you've lost that, that real nice simplicity of what Hamilton's rule is. It becomes much more complicated to figure out what the relatedness is, what the benefit is, what the cost is, and you can make mistakes. You can make mistakes in your calculations. So it's no longer so easy to, to do use this rule not that it's not applicable, but you've lost sort of, I think, a lot of the rationale for why you want to use it in the first place. The last one I want to sort of raise as a problem is what we call point of view. So again, we can sort of have now two siblings, A and B, they're interacting. And if they don't cooperate, both A and B go off on their own and they both raise two of their own kids. Sort of here, A prime and B prime, right? So no cooperation, everybody goes off, everybody has two kids. If they cooperate, then what happens in this example is B will give up all B's reproduction to help A. And so A will now have five kids <coughs> instead of two. B will have no kids instead of two. And so you can ask, should B cooperate with A? Is it, does it make sense? Even if they're full siblings, should they cooperate? And the answer, again, from Hamilton's rule is very simple. The answer is no, because Two of your own kids are worth more than three nieces and nephews. Again, that sort of falls just plain as day out of the R, B minus C. Two of your own kids are always worth more than, than three nephews and nieces. Fine, B should not cooperate. But what about the parents, right? So what would the parents want in this situation? Well, now the point of view is completely changed. What the parents see is, oh, they don't care who reproduces. 
They just want to count the number of grandkids. So in this case, cooperation produces five grandkids. No cooperation produces only four. So from the same problem, the parental point of view says cooperation ought to happen. From the point of view of one of the siblings, cooperation ought not to happen. Now the problem then again is if you're looking at a trait that could evolve, you know, should parents manipulate their kids into cooperating versus should evolution oppose that manipulation, what's the outcome? Again, it could be easy, it could be figured out, but it's not obvious from these two point of views as to who's going to intrinsically win this, this fight this evolutionary sort of conflict between parents wanting cooperation and individuals not wanting to cooperate. So again, so these sort of three different aspects, I think, give you pause as to these are cases where, where RB minus C <coughs> might be either difficult to use or sometimes give you the wrong answer. Now, let's look at the reverse case, right? So we've had some, some examples of where it might not be so good. But what are the advantages of Hamilton's rule? Well, first and foremost, biology is not math. And that gets back to, to, to the quote I put up from Nowak, which is, you know, math is, is the only thing. If you don't have the math, you don't have anything. Uh, we can also realize that sort of the Newtonian laws of physics are not correct, right? They're not correct. The world actually is Einstein and relativity. But Unless you're sort of navigating your spaceship around the sort of the close up to a black hole, Newtonian physics actually works pretty well. It's a pretty good approximation of, of how the world works. So you can then use it to make sort of what in some ways is a sort of counterintuitive prediction. So suppose I were standing here on a skateboard holding a big heavy ball. And I wanted to move that way. How could I do it? Well, I throw the ball that way. And that would move me this way. And that's Newtonian physics. Doesn't seem sort of necessarily intuitively obvious that I should do something in that direction to go that direction, but it works. It's effective. And even though we might realize that it's not actually a descriptor of everything in the universe, it's pretty damn good. And so that's a very powerful argument. And that's what, what all of these cosigners of that huge paper had to say, which is that Hamilton's rule works. And it's worked in all of these sort of cases about generating predictions, about ge experiments that support those predictions, and so on. So again and again and again and again, it works. And so Nowak et al. basically, again, offer no testable <laughs> alternative model. What's the testable alternative model? Oh, well, groups are more reproductively successful than solitary individuals? Yeah, of course, but so what? And what goes back is that, that the NOAC paper gave no single example of any of these where the math, where the use of Hamilton's rule gave you an absolutely wrong prediction. So I'm going back to my sort of skateboard analogy. So right, so I'm standing on my skateboard with my heavy ball, and Newtonian physics says if I throw it this way, I'm going to move that way. But what if general relativity said, oh, if I throw the ball this way, I'm actually going to move that way too. You know? So in other words, it gives you some sort of prediction about the world that's obviously testable that really undermines what you would sort of think is going on. And there was not a single example of, of any of these in any of the NOAC papers that said, okay, well, here's how kin selection got it wrong in the first place. Except for that one. And that was not by them. That one's by me. <laughs> OK. What I want to present is one example of where I think kin selection actually seriously gets it wrong. And that's what's <laughs> called the evolution of use sociality, or what's called the monogamy hypothesis. And again, it starts with a very simple actor-based logic, right? What is the benefit of making an offspring? That offspring is going to be related to you, if you're a nice diploid organism, by 0.5. What is the benefit of making, uh, helping your parents make a full sibling? Again, if you're a nice diploid organism, the benefit is going to be 0.5. You're equally related to your offspring as you are to your full sibling. So if you play around with Hamilton's rule, basically you get R greater than C divided by B for both of them being identical. 
So in other words, any little bit of increased benefit or reduced cost for helping siblings um, is, going to, is going to favor you giving up your own reproduction to help siblings. And if, you, if they're not full siblings, right, so if you only share one of the parents, <coughs> then the R value drops by half, and suddenly you see that you really have to be much more beneficial for half siblings, or they have to be much less costly for you to favor half, helping half siblings over full siblings. And so this is the argument for what's called the monogamy hypothesis, is that there's a whole planopy of species out there. Some of them are monogamous, some of them are polygamous. Now they don't evolve monogamy to be social, but they evolve it for other reasons. But the argument then is that those that happen to be monogamous are going to be much more likely to eventually evolve sociality. Sociality is going to be easier to evolve in those species because of this Hamilton's rule, actor-based kind of thing. Very obvious, right? Should always help full <coughs> siblings more than half siblings. This is the way it goes. And in fact, there's some really cool data out there. This is with Hymenoptera by, by Hughes et al. And the title says it all. Uh, ancestral monogamy shows kin selection is the key to the evolution of eusociality. Again, if you go back and you look at all of those uh, uh, hymenopteran species and do a phylogenetic analysis, the most likely state for the way back when solitary ancestor is that it was monogamous. So it supports the monogamy hypothesis. And about a year ago, uh, Cornwallis et al. published sort of a very similar analysis of cooperative breeding in birds. And even though I, I mislabeled, it's not actually monogamy, it should say lower promiscuity or less promiscuity up here. Again, they found the same pattern, that the putative ancestor of all these cooperative species was probably not mating that often with that many males. So again, uh, I mean, you can obviously trust this data more because it's in a circle. Okay, um, so you have two phylogenetic analyses here, that, again, that sort of come up with exactly what the monogamy hypothesis predicts. So, I was thinking about this, and sort of said, okay, well, if we then believe this, or if we have problems with the Nowak et al. model, if Nowak et al. Is, is, is correct, then basically if we do sort of a population genetics kind of model, if we sort of say, instead of an actor base, should I help full siblings force my own offspring, um, if we sort of have, again, sort of this idea of a helping gene, a helping allele, would this helping allele actually spread through the population faster if that population behaved monogamously versus if that population had multiple mating, polygamy, and so on? So in other words, would we get a different result from, from this actor-based model than we got from, than, uh, uh, we got, than we'll get from um, this gene-based model. Now, why would I even think that we would get a different result? This diagram. So, if we think for a moment that A is our helping allele, and by the way, this could be, this doesn't have to be helping, it can be sort of uh, manipulate your offspring into helping kind of allele, so it doesn't have to be for them. If that allele is rare, and you have a female that doesn't have that allele, she's not going to have a helper unless she mates with a male that does. And by the way, this is sort of a haplodiploid model, so males are haploid here. They only have one copy. Females are diploid, but it's not going to matter, it turns out. So if that allele is rare, and you mate with one male, you might get lucky, and that male might, in fact, have that allele, and then all your offspring are going to have that allele, and you're going to have a higher chance of, of having helpers. If you mate multiply, then it's like buying four lottery tickets. You're going to have four chances that one of those males is actually going to have that allele, and some of your offspring are going to have uh, or stick around and be helpers. And so in other words, in this, this putative example here of comparing one versus four, this individual is four times more likely to have a helper daughter by mating with four different males. However, because she's mated with four different males, and the assumption is using the sperm randomly, 25% um, fewer of the sibs are going to have that cooperative allele. So in other words, what's going to happen here is you're going to compare a high variance, low variance strategy. So this is 
This is high variance with a high payoff. So in other words, you, you get that allele not so often, but when you do, all your offspring are going to have that same allele. Here, you're going to have more likely that you're going to have that allele in one of your offspring, but <coughs> fewer of them are going to share. In essence, if you look at those two numbers, they, uh, they equal out. So this sort of suggests that potentially, potentially, an allele could spread just as fast through a population with multiple mating as it could with single mating. And so we modeled it, or I modeled it. And again, because I'm a hymenoptera, social insect kind of guy, I sort of thought about it in a wasp way. And so I have a mother wasp raising a cohort of five offspring here. And what can happen is she can follow a solitary life history. So in other words, she raises those five, they all disperse away. And if she survives, she raises five more and they all disperse away. And if she survives, she raises five more out to some number and then she dies because winter appears. So that's sort of a solitary life history. And in comparison to that, you could have a social life history where, again, she raises five offspring, but now if one of them has the right allele, they stick back and they help. And the help they provide is not to make, make larger nests or anything. The help is basically what we'll see is what we call insurance. So in other words, if mom survives, the next brood again is five, and because she has a helper here, those five disperse. And so if this is what happens, basically this helper is wasted resources. It's useless. You know, it didn't actually help. It didn't make, didn't raise any more offspring and so on. So we're not assuming that the helper adds any offspring. We're not assuming that mom can now double the size of her brood or anything like that. Although the model is fairly insensitive to those assumptions. But what we are assuming is that what could happen is mom dies. And in this case, again, thinking as a, as a wasp biologist, if mom dies, everybody else dies. They need at least one adult on the nest to sort of have the nest survive. But now, if, if daughter is stick, stuck around, daughter is now the insurance, mom is dead, daughter is still there, daughter can keep producing more siblings. And eventually, in this model, daughter can, once those, that first brood of siblings is gone, daughter can now start adding her own eggs and raising her own offspring. So daughter has both sort of direct fitness, she can inherit the nest, and daughter has indirect fitness, she helps siblings that would have died otherwise. So there's two aspects to it. And this is sort of very much in, in, in the biology of wasps. This is what paper wasps kind of do. So okay, we can play around with the survival rates, and what we find is when survival rates between those two cohorts is very, very low, you get no cooperation. So good, cooperation doesn't always evolve, and this is independent of number of fathers. As we start raising survival rates a little bit, we find that monogamy is favored. So in other words, if you mated with one father, cooperation sweeps through the population of two fathers, but not with five fathers. But you keep raising it, and you find that suddenly there's no difference. Cooperation sweeps through at the same rate. And you keep raising it, and you see that it actually reverses at some point. And now, the cooperate allele sweeps through the population faster when you mate multiply than when you mate singly. And we can put all these together, and we can sort of look at the sort of the survival rate and the relative time to which the population now has 50% of the cooperative allele. So looking at sort of spreading through and compare it to, you know, your, your monogamous situation. And what we find is that there's sort of a, a, an area where monogamy sweeps through faster. There's an area where it's sort of equal. And then there's a large area where actually it sweeps through faster with multiple mating. And so this is with five wasps. Remember that little diagram, five wasps? Well, you can do it with one instead of five, so each one is raised sequentially as opposed to five at a time. You get the same result with sort of different, uh, slightly different values of survival, but you get sort of a, a monogamy favored, equal, and then polygamy. <coughs> so similar results also, this is with, with the allele being dominant, similar results with the allele being recessive, similar results when you make the males diploid. So those things don't matter. You get the exact same sort of thing. A whole region here where there's no difference and a whole region, large region, where actually multiple mating is favored. Okay, why is multiple mating favored? Well, what happens is, again, this situation is much more likely when you mate multiply, especially when the allele is very rare. 
But this situation up here is very non-random. So those daughters that inherit the nest, those daughters that provide the benefit, are only the ones that are going to have the helping allele. So in other words, uh, they're the only ones that are going to sort of gain from this. And it turns out, again, when you mate multiply, this happens just a lot more often. And so that gives that allele a particular advantage, again, sort of an assortment sort of thing. Now, that's fine. The last thing I sort of wanted to do here was to allow mating number to actually be genetically determined. So in the previous examples, I sort of said, okay, randomly determined whether or not females mated once or multiple times. But what if we make that an actual allele, a genetic, uh, a heritable thing? And what we find then is this result here. In one generation, if we start out the alleles at equal frequencies, 50-50, so 50% of the females mate with one male, 50% of the females mate with five males. In one generation, you see the increase in the, uh, in the allele for multiple mating goes way up. So in other words, you get very strong selection very quickly. And as the helping allele frequency increases, everybody's getting helpers, and therefore that selection sort of disappears. But initially, what you're getting in all of these populations is selection for polygamy. And what I want to point out is the yellow line that in those previous graphs where I actually showed even, even in these situations monogamy was increasing or, or sweeping through, with populations that have both mating types in them, polygamy is actually good for. So what does that mean? Well, that means that monogamy may be ancestral, but it's sort of coincidental to other factors. And so it doesn't, it means that monogamy does not sort of spring load a species ready to evolve cooperation. That my model suggests that there's sort of really, that your mating strategy is, in a large sense, irrelevant to whether or not cooperation is going to evolve or not. So if you cannot use this relationship as prima facie evidence for kin selection. It's there, I'm not going to argue about the phylogeny, other people <coughs> argue about the phylogeny, but not me. Um, but simply that's a correlation. It is not necessarily, you cannot infer causation from that correlation. Okay, go back to this model again. Is, does that mean that Wilson is correct? That in fact, oh man, you know, cooperation doesn't matter at all, you know, for this. Well, one of the nice things that you can do with models that you can't do with real animals is you can do experiments that are totally impossible. So what I can do in this example here is, this is what I talked about before. So even if this individual is taking care of a lot of half sibs, this relatedness here is still greater than zero. In other words, it's still taking care of some number of relatives. Even though they might not be full sibs, it's still taking care of relatives. What you can do then is in your model, you can basically shuffle everybody around. And so in other words, the helpers drift. And they don't help the nest necessarily they're born on. They help some nest randomly in the population. That makes their relatedness on average to the individuals they're helping at a population level zero. So they're not gaining anything in terms of indirect fitness. They're only going to gain from direct fitness in terms of, again, of being able to inherit the nest. When you do this, lo and behold, can't get cooperation to evolve. Doesn't matter the survival rate, doesn't matter the number of fathers, cooperation doesn't evolve with direct fitness only. You need kinship, some manner of kinship. You're either going to be taking care of half sibs, full sibs, whatever, but you need kinship for cooperation to actually have evolved. So the model then says, okay, kinship actually does matter, you know, but not necessarily high levels of relatedness or low relatives of relatedness. And it also then says that Nowak et al. may be right. So this simple actor-based monogamy hypothesis may not hold up when you look at it from sort of a population genetics allele-based model. You get different results. Now the question then again is even though I showed that, that, that kinship matters, that doesn't necessarily mean that it matters more than this group structure that I have in my model. So is Wilson correct? Does selection across the group level drive the evolution of cooperation more so than selection within. And that, at long last, brings me to the second axis of my talk, which is that whether or not you believe 
in and this idea that that uh, that. Hamilton's rule is effective or not in terms of describing cooperation, that doesn't mean that it's actually at determining cooperation. So what Wilson is more or less saying is that you, what you're seeing cooperation is happening across groups and not within groups. And again, the alternative view, our, our dark lord Dawkins again, um, says that basically it's happening only within groups, not across groups. Now this, again, has really upset a lot of people because they view it as sort of, uh, um, you know, a rechewing of this old, old group selection argument between Wynne Edwards and George Williams. That everyone sort of thought was settled, done with, and so on, and they're really mad at Wilson because they view him as trying to resurrect this fallacious old argument. And, uh, you know, for, for, um, Clarity, I was a postdoc in Wilson's lab for several years, so I do know the man. And I do know that he's a great naturalist, but he's not a great sort of theoretical mathematical biologist. So I have to say that Wilson's <coughs> argument for how a cross-group selection works is total crap. <laughs> Hope he doesn't download this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but. This is, this is well, how we think about cooperation evolving by classic kin selection, right? So we have a solitary population. What happens is these individuals that I've sort of color-coded as being all sort of similar have high genetic similarity. They like each other because they have high genetic similarity. They come into a nice social group. They all help each other because they're highly related. And you eventually get this elaboration of a large, effective eusocial group. That's kind of a, a cartoon version of classical kin selection. Here's what Wilson is proposing. Solitary population, they get together not because they share genes everywhere throughout their genome, but because they share that little red dot. In other words, what Wilson called a social allele. So for whatever reason, they just hang out together because they like to hang out together, and only those with that particular social allele are going to hang out together. Not at the genome wide. So if you measured relatedness across all the genome, you'd find relatedness is actually very low. <coughs> now what he proposes is that, well, who are you going to breed with? Well, you're going to breed with whoever's around, and after a while you're going to inbreed and so on, and the result is going to happen is you're going to get eventually higher levels of relatedness simply because you're kind of inbreeding. With each other. But his argument then is that that high relatedness is sort of a byproduct of this initial social allele group formation. It's not what's driving the evolution at all. And then again, you sort of elaborate out to sort of some nice eusocial group. Now, there's two problems with this <coughs> why this doesn't work. One is this social allele is exactly what people call a green beard allele. So in other words, it's, it's, it's relatedness not at the genome level, but it's relatedness at one locus, one gene locus. Now, I could have another hour of arguments about how important green beards are or not important, but in fact, for this talk, it's well within the milieu of kin selection. This is exactly kin selection, but looked at at a single locus level than at a whole genome level, and in fact relates all the way back to Hamilton's original paper. So there's nothing there's nothing groupy about this. This is kin selection, but at a slightly different level. And then, even if you sort of give that a pass and say, okay, this happens here, this section from here can be completely, totally classical kin selection. So again, there's no reason to believe that, that once you get high relatedness, in fact, maybe that's the, the precursor to getting this more sort of elaborated social eusociality to evolve in the same place. So again, simply the fact that groups form that are low related, eventually going to high related groups, you can have kin selection. There's nothing to say that it couldn't be important in that whole process as well. So, let me then put everybody in their place. So we've got these two axes, we've got two arguments, sort of is, is Price's equation, is uh, Hamilton's rule general or special, does selection dominate within groups or across groups, and fortunately none of them are in this room, or they might yell at me where I put them, but this is sort of where I kind of put those various luminaries in terms of, of what they've been arguing for both in press and on various blogs and so forth. 
Couple of things to note here. One is Nowak and Wilson have very different agendas. Nowak, for a large part, doesn't really care about you know, whether selection is happening within or across groups. He's just basically saying, you can't use Hamilton's rule. You can't use inclusive fitness. You've got to do it population genetics. Wilson, for the most part, doesn't care what rule you use, what math you use. He's basically arguing selection happens at the level of the group, across groups, not within groups. So they're really sort of at two endpoints here. The second thing, and this is why, why I think you can probably guess why there's so much acrimony in how people talk, is they divide up really into very separate camps with not a lot of overlap. There's only sort of a few people that seem to try to kind of be somewhere in the middle and, and sort of see viewpoints of both sides. So basically you got the people in the red and the people in the blue <coughs> yelling at each other because they just think the other side is just completely, totally off base. Now, I told you that I think Ed is not a good theoretical biologist. So I think his model, his explanation for how group selection works just doesn't hold water. There's just no way that it's really different from kin selection or workable. But Ed is probably the preeminent natural biologist. So is he on to something? Has he actually seen something in the world that suggests that things are happening, evolving at the group? And he just doesn't have a good mechanism to explain it. So is he actually on to something? And does Ed, can Ed's ideas get there from here? So in other words, is there a way you can go from a solitary population to a youth social group that doesn't really involve being nepotistic to your kin? And this is where I come in again. So very briefly, I'm going to talk about what, what some ideas we've been working on. It's called social heterosis. And it's a way of perhaps giving a mechanism to explain what Ed is proposing. And the general idea is this. You start out with a group of four individuals. If they're all very similar, this is how well they do. The size of the circle sort of indicates. If one of them happens to be a little bit different, then the group does better. If two of them happen to be different, then the group does a little bit better even yet. If all of them happen to be different, then the group does better yet. And the idea here, again, is a very simple one, is that there's sort of a positive effect of allele diversity. Because these individuals, either they're not competing as much for the same resources, or they have different sets of skills that they can bring to the group. They have different abilities. And the group can have more abilities than any single individual can have. So you can have all kinds of skills within that group that you might not be able to have if everybody was identical. And so again, some little examples here. You know, you can't be spotted and black at the same time. You can't be aggressive and shy at the same time. You can't be rigidly inflexible or infinitely malleable at the same time. <laughs> but Groups can be. So groups can contain these various, various sort of uh, uh, um, different personalities, different, uh, different abilities. And I put this as an example of size variation foraging group. And I put this in because that's now Dr. Karen Kapheim. Hi, Karen, if you're watching this. Um, it also adds, adds, you know, gets away from all those Y chromosomes. Um, so, this is work that she and I have been basically been working in, so I have to give her equal credit to whatever I'm going to say next here. And so again, you have this increasing positive effect of allele diversity, but how do you actually get selection to maintain this diversity in social behavior? And there's a, there's a big theoretical problem here. So I've drawn all the circles at the same size. So in other words, all the genotypes do equally well and diverse. But that's <coughs> probably not going to be generally true. So what you're going to have is some genotypes are maybe going to do a little bit better because of the diversity of the other, uh, than the others. And what that means is that basically if you just allow selection to happen within the group, you're going to lose diversity. Even though eventually you're going to end up with a group that's not nearly as effective or, or, or successful as a diverse group because some genotypes are going to be advantageous uh, they're going to remove the other ones. So 
what we basically did, and I'm not going to go through this, you can look at the, the, the whole modeling uh, details in that paper. What we found was you can actually maintain this diversity if you have a cross-group selection. And what you need, more or less, is that that individual has to do better than that individual, has to do better than that individual, has to do better than that individual. So if the fitness of this individual in this diverse group is higher than this individual in this less diverse group, and this is higher than that, and that is higher than that, mathematically it becomes possible with this across group selection to maintain all four of those alleles, or even more alleles if you want. So in other words, uh, this sort of across group advantage uh, maintains the allele diversity very nicely indeed, but you have to have a cross group selection. And we even went further, we sort of looked at what happens if you get linked loci, right? So now instead of just, just one locus with a number of alleles at it, suppose you have two loci. And again, here are the alleles that by themselves would do really well, and then those two would not do so well. But if they're in a group together, again, the group with all of those loci in it does better than groups with, with reduced diversity. And again, I'm not going to show you the model or the graphs or anything, but I'm just going to basically tell you that what happens is if you start out with all four possible combinations or all eight possible combinations, very rapidly you go from four to two or those two. But what happens is you maintain, in this situation, all four alleles in the population. And in this one where you have, again, you have, you have six different alleles at three different sites, uh, very rapidly you just get down to sort of two haplotypes, two combinations, but you maintain all six alleles in the population. So in other words, even when you sort of link these loci, you still get this sort of effect. And so you get a loss of what's called gametic diversity, but not allelic diversity. So the model works under a whole lot of different assumptions and so on. Very good. Now I toss this up here very quickly because this is obviously not the only model out there in the world that, that, that tells you how you maintain diversity. There are a lot of other things and we're not arguing that this is now somehow going to replace all those other models, but what happens is we maintain genetic diversity in opposition to drift and strong directional selection in our model and we still maintain diversity. And, not that we're saying these don't work, but they're not in our model. And so it works without any of these sort of classical explanations as to, to what keeps diversity in populations. So you can sort of think of it as being something else that you can add to this list of things that maintain genetic diversity. Okay, closing then. How does social heterosis work in social groups? Well, again, what you would argue then is that if you were this individual, versus that individual, you could say these are sort of clones of each other, genetically identical, this individual would have higher fitness because it happens to be in a group that's more diverse than that individual. And so again, within groups, and i got to give you a picture of a nice cute social group, right? Uh, within groups, groups that have higher diversity would simply do better than groups that have lower diversity. Now, we're extending this to sort of say, well, you don't actually need to have really <coughs> social groups. You can have asocial neighborhoods as long as, again, this individual is interacting with more heterogeneous population than, say, that individual. And so, again, if you sort of make arbitrary little groupings out of them, you can sort of make diverse groups, less diverse groups. And if you want a picture of this, be something like that, where, again, a group of plants in a more diverse neighborhood may be more reproductively successful than groups of plants that are in sort of a more homogeneous neighborhood. And so the point I want to make is that there's always this irreconcilable trade-off, genetic relatedness versus genetic diversity. And when we're arguing that when social heterosis is important, it's important when diversity trumps relatedness. So in other words, when, when, when diverse groups are doing better than nepotistic groups, that's when you're going to maintain diversity. And so instead of this Wilson versus Dawkins kind of argument, what I want to sort of say is social heterosis versus kin nepotism. And what I want to argue is that there isn't, that, that one does not necessarily always trump the other. That in essence there, there are two different ways that selection operates. So in some cases selection may favor the evolution of high genetic diversity 
through a mechanism like ours, social heterosis. And in some cases, there might be a lot of things that are favored by being nepotistic towards individuals that are closely related, <coughs> favoring high genetic similarity. So you can go down either one of those two pathways. So if we go back to Ed's group selection model, let's improve it a little bit and simply say again, you may get coming together for a social allele or for other reasons, but what I'm proposing is that there are two pathways to use sociality. One is our classic sort of higher relatedness, kin nepotism pathway, and the other is to continually sort of add this sort of diversity element to it, making the group the, the working better unit. And to close, two examples of social heterosis perhaps. One is back to this nice little phylogeny of the hymenoptera. Remember, monogamy is the ancestral state. But the thing that strikes me about this phylogeny is the following, is how often within this phylogeny multiple mating has evolved. It's evolved 22 times independently within this phylogeny. So something is selecting for low diversity. And the final example, again, you might sort of think about for an audience like this, is human personalities. Why are we all different? Why are we not alike? Why are we behave in different ways? Well, again, you can sort of think about that you have a group where everybody is the same because they're genetically very similar, right? There, there are advantages to this, you know, fewer arguments, you know, uh, same sets of interests and so on. Groups that are genetically dissimilar, you know, may argue a lot more may disagree about things a lot more, but on the other hand, they may have a much wider range of abilities, both mental and physical, and they may be much more willing to sort of seek things in novel ways and so on. And again, I'm not arguing that one necessarily trumps the other, but I think that all of us could sort of think about situations where one type of group might in fact be selected over another. And so certain traits, if you go back to social insects, you know, why does, why does a worker give up reproduction completely? Well, that might go down this pathway of genetic similarity. You can only do that by helping your kin. Why do groups that are genetically different forage better? You know, why are they better disease resistant? That may go down this pathway. So different traits may go down different pathways. And so in essence, we can't really always predict which groups do better. And in fact, the last social heterosis is possibly what I've been talking about this entire time, is you have very intelligent people who looked at the same facts and have come to diametrically opposed conclusions about what's going on here and so on. And that, in the long run, I think is good for science, that everybody sort of disagrees and challenges each other and so on. And so when you sort of think about it, again, there are fitness trade-offs. Again, you can sort of think about any human trait you want. There are sort of advantages to it and there are sort of negative advantages or negative costs to it. And what groups do is they take advantage of those benefits and they oftentimes buffer the costs, which is, I think, again, why this sort of social heterosis can work. And at that point, I sort of run on to too much and I want to leave it with this then that, yeah, I think kin selection is still alive and well, but so is genetic diversity. And I think we sort of have to think about both of them uh, in our times. So thank you for paying attention to this. And I'm glad to take any questions.